Good morning, class. Today is April um, 21st, Tuesday. We're going to go ahead and get started with our ELA lesson for today. So today, as you can see on our agenda, we're going to read the Golden Age of Greece and also Ancient Egypt's Golden Empire. So we're going to be reading them from ancient um, achievements of ancient cultures, our reading booklet for this unit. So go ahead and get that out. Um, I also have my highlighter. Our activity tomorrow and for our reflection for the end of the week goes with these stories. So I'm going to highlight key points. Um, and I'll tell you, of course, what I highlight so that you guys can highlight it on your end if you choose to. So going off of what we talked about yesterday, when we talked about how civilizations um, are great or show achievements, have made goals, have made strides in our society today. Um, two of the uh, two of the achievements that have made the most, I feel, and two of the civilizations that have made the most goal, um, I want to say goals, like uh, impact on our world today are Greece, the civilization of Greece, and the civilization of Egypt. They have brought us democracy, the writing, hieroglyphics, all of these civilizations that, and cultures and achievements that have made our world great and how it is today. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. We're gonna focus on Greece and we're gonna focus on Egypt. So go ahead and open to page four, the golden age of Greece. Go ahead and follow along as I read. So I'm gonna go ahead and start reading. The Golden Age of Greece by Catherine Goodridge. Ancient Greece fought a long series of wars with Persia from 499 BCE to 488 BCE. After the war, Greece had to rebuild the country. The era of rebuilding became known as the Golden Age of Greece. I'm gonna go ahead and take my highlighter out and I'm gonna highlight this era from the era of rebuilding became known as the Golden Age of Greece. It lasted about 200 years, from about 500 to 300 BCE. Um, you'll learn, I guess, you'll, we'll learn about this throughout your duration of middle school and high school. Uh, it's kind of complicated, it's kind of weird. So anything BCE is gonna count from the higher number down to zero, and then um, it's going to count from after that, it's going to count from zero and up. So we're talking about this 200 period that's starting at 500 BCE, and it's going to last for 200 years. So that counts down, actually, instead of counting up. So from 500 to 400 is obviously 100 years, and then 400 to 300 is 200 years. So... For that 200 year period it goes from 500 BCE to 300 BCE so you can kind of at this point see we're almost to that zero point um, which kind of is that turnaround for the time counting era and the time counts to be pushed back up into numerical order but at this point we're kind of at like that backwards numerical order just as a background art during this period flourished. So we talked about how yesterday, how art was a big aspect. So they're talking about how it flourished. And the work that survived are considered, considered classics today. The Canadian Museum of History states the golden age of Greece laid foundations of Western civilizations. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that piece of um, information right here. So starting at the Canadian Museum, of history states the golden age of Greece laid the foundations of Western civilization. Let's break that down a little bit. It's saying how the golden age of Greece laid the foundation, it laid the background. We talked about how Athens brought us democracy and Sparta was a militaristic state. So their key achievements in that period led to the foundation of Western civilization in today's world. Okay. Religion was very important to ancient Greeks. They built temples and monuments to their gods and goddesses. We are going to be learning about mythology during our social studies in the next month or so. 
This is my personal favorite part of history about the Greek mythology. I think it's fascinating. I love learning about all the Greek different Greek gods and goddesses. There was hundreds of them that the Greek civil, uh, Greek civilians honored and built statues for, built monuments for. So we'll learn more about that to come. But in the story that we're reading today, it's a huge, huge, huge part of how Greek civilization transformed through the years or through the centuries, actually. Um, these structures were rectangular and built surrounded long inner chambers. So on the bottom of your page right here, you can see kind of what they're talking about. Um, if you ever go to Greece, um, I personally have not made, have gotten the chance to go there yet. Um, and if you tour where Athens and them were in that uh, back then, Athens is still around. But if you go to where the temples were, you'll these, these buildings are still standing. So you're able to go and tour them. It's amazing, actually, to go and see this, the years of culture and history. But they're talking about all of these buildings and statues and monuments that we were talking about kind of had that same look, right? So if I walked up to it and be like, oh, that was ancient Greece, right? So they have that rectangular or like square figure and they have these beautiful long stone columns in front that go all the way around the entire building, right? Imagine how heavy and difficult these were to attach to the buildings and they did these without tools. They had their own tools, but they didn't have cranes to lift these up, right? Okay. Um, they were made with materials such as marble or limestone. Tall columns surrounded long inner chambers. At the center of the temple was a statue of the god or goddess who protected the surrounding community. Okay, so that's basically talking about how this temple was meant and protected the statue inside that was protect that was of the god or goddess that was protecting and there was these giant like i don't even huge 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 um like bigger than the statue of liberty statues made of pure marble that were hand carved of these gods and goddesses these are amazing achievements that in today that we can still view and discover and it's incredible so that's one of the main achievements of ancient Greece in the golden, especially in that golden age of Greece when all of these um, architectural achievements are coming about. Okay, let's go ahead and flip over. Actually, at the very bottom, this is a picture of the building of the Parthenon. The Parthenon, um, there's actually two, well obviously the original Parthenon in Greece and Athens, but there is a duplicate in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it does have a duplicate of the statue. So it's not the original, but it is still beautiful and breathtaking to see and go inside and see all of that aspect. That's kind of a little fun fact about that. Um, but it says the Parthenon was built um, of the Greek goddess Athena. Athena was the goddess of beauty and warfare. So the Parthenon was built as a monument to honor the goddess of Athena. Today, it ruins, its ruins stand on the apocalypse on a rocky hill above the city of Athens. So, they have done, I wouldn't say repairs, but more of like upkeep. But the building is still exactly how it was in that era. So, it's really, really, really cool to see the architecture and the design and the art that was put into these buildings. Okay, so we flip over. Okay, so it says on the top right on this blue little bubble, it says the statue of Athena at the Academy of Athens. She is the patroness of the city and the goddess of wisdom, war, and of the arts. Okay, so let's continue on. To paragraph three. The many statues of gods and goddesses demonstrate the powerful role that gods played in the lives of Greek citizens. The Greek sculptor Phidias made two monumental statues, one of the goddess of Athena for the Parthenon in Athens, 
Again, we talked about how the Parthenon was built to protect the statue of Athena as a monument and a gift for the goddess to help protect the citizens in Athens. And the other was a statue of Zeus, which made which he made for the Temple of Zeus in Olympia. Both were over 40 feet high. So 40 feet high, that's pretty high. That's pretty big, pretty big statue made out of pure marble. Um, Zeus is one of the three top gods. Again, we'll learn about this again. So there's Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon. They are the top gods. Zeus is known as like the protector overall. So he has a lot of famous history, famous monuments, statues made of him throughout Greece and some in different museums around the world, even in our country today, even in the United States, with country with museums and stuff built to honor Greek gods and goddesses. So these lives, the life-size statues of ordinary men and women reflect the Greek love of beauty. So we talked about how art was a huge aspect during this golden age of Greece. Artists used a variety of materials, including marble, bronze, or even gold, to create lifelike figures. Some statues even suggest movement, such as running or throwing. Let's go ahead and highlight artists used a variety of materials. This kind of really talked about how important they were to the Greek citizens. They used materials like marble, bronze, and gold. These are not cheap materials. So for them to build 40 feet high statues of these figures, it really shows how much Greek life centered around these gods and goddesses. Okay, other arts also thrived during the Golden Age. Painters used pottery as their canvases to portray scenes from mythology and daily life. So let's highlight pottery. They used pottery as a way to show their daily life. So pottery was able to be encased and protected, which is how we discovered it to this day and are able to expand on their thought processes and get an inside look about their daily life. Um, these paintings showed people riding horses, drinking and eating and playing instruments. This also gave us a look into the Greek games um, Greece was one of the founders of the, uh, the true founders of the Olympics, right? So we were able to see what they perceived as the Olympic Games. They had things like javelin, they had things like running, jumping, but they also had things like sparring, different other aspects that transitioned into sports that are around today, but also gave us an insight of how they viewed athleticism and creativity in that time period. Unfortunately, not all in, not all of the art and architecture of ancient Greece has survived. However, through artifacts and continued research, we continue to learn why this period in Greek history deserves to be called the Golden Age. So it's obviously due to unforeseeable events such as nature, natural disasters, weather, not everything was able to survive during this time, but the pieces that did survive, we gained critical insight into the discovery, the creations, the art that was <laughs> that was created during this golden age of Greece that really provided a key insight of how much art and beauty was incorporated into society and it's really incredible for us to see these buildings that still stand that they didn't have cranes or anything like that to operate they used their own hands to create these wonderful monuments to gods and greek goddesses so it's really incredible to see that aspect of where they held court where they created democracy where they had the spartan oligarchy it's all important to the greek civilization Okay, so we're going to go ahead, so that was our first story, the Golden Age of Greece. Let's go ahead and jump over to Egypt. So let's go ahead and flip over to the next page on page six. So this is kind of, I know we talked about, um, you guys talked about Egypt in the beginning of the year, but we're going to kind of bounce back 
Egypt and Greece are kind of very similarly um, put placed together to compare and contrast the differences. They're very similar civilizations in their achievements and their discoveries. So that's why they're put together. Um, so let's go ahead and read this. This story is a little bit longer, um, but not too much, only four pages. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, ancient Egypt's Golden Empire. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start off with paragraph one. Historians generally agree that Egypt's golden age began with its, with its 18th dynasty. Okay, so let's pause right there for a second. We just talked about the golden age of Greece. So we kind of see that common theme coming up, and now we're talking about the golden age of Egypt. So let's go ahead and highlight Egypt's golden age between uh, 18th century, and we're talking about 1507 and 1340. So you can really see the time frame of when Egypt was in a popular civilization to where Greece was, because Egypt was in 1507 to 1340 BCE was its golden age, whereas we learned that ancient Greece was 500 BCE. So it really, I would say probably a thousand year difference. Okay, so we can really see the difference in technology in the growth when they built the pyramids from when they built the Parthenon, okay? Um, so began with its 18th century, dynasty, 1507 to 1340 BCE, when the succession of powerful pharaohs, including Tutankhamun, extended Egypt's influence into the Near East. This golden age produced massive pyramid temples and tombs filled with golden treasures. So let's highlight golden age produced massive pyramids, temples, and tombs filled with golden treasures. It really talks about how um, they built these tombs to protect their treasures, very similarly to ancient Greece when they built the monuments to protect the statues. The artifacts of this period, period have allowed archaeologists to study and understand daily lives of ancient Egyptians. Howard Carter, an English archaeologist, described what he saw when he first entered King Tutankhamun's tomb, saying, As my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues of gold, everywhere, in the, everywhere was a glint of gold. From mummies to golden treasures, findings like these tell us history of ancient Egypt. On the bottom, you see how they put a picture of the solid gold coffin of Pharaoh Tutankhamun. So it just talks about how important, not even the life of the Pharaoh, but the afterlife, right? This was his way of them surviving his and maintaining his presence his impact on Egypt civilization, right? So they built him this solid gold um, sarcophagus and this solid gold tomb. Let's move on to the next section. It talks about, so this one's talking about basically like a background. The next section's talking about architecture. So let's pick up on paragraph two. The afterlife was very important to ancient Egyptians and they built large structures to honor the dead. When one of the common people when one of the common people died, priests mummified the body by treating it with oils and wrapping it in cloth. The body was buried in a simple tomb. So it even talks about how the afterlife was even important for ancient uh, just uh, ancient civilians in the life of Egypt, right? Egypt uh, builders, Egypt merchants, anyone a uh, civil uh, a member of that of society was so was even just as important as a pharaoh, right? So they're talking about how even just um, civilians in ancient Egypt were put into tombs and mummified so that they had a peaceful afterlife in society. It was so important for them to protect them in the afterlife as well, right? It was their responsibility. So the pharaohs, on the other hand, were entombed in giant pyramids. So, I mean, it even talks about how there is a difference, right? So if I was a pharaoh, I would get, they got pyramids to protect them. But even if I was a civilian, I still got 
a tomb, right? So it wasn't just like we're just going to leave it over here after you pass. It's they still have that environment to where they're protected. Building the pyramids was an enormous task. The blocks weighed between 2 to 17 tons each. So kind of give you a reference. A car probably weighs between 2 to 5 tons, right? Or thousands of pounds, right? So tons, that's a lot of weight. And they had to create pulleys and stuff. And they weren't powered by electronics. Like you couldn't press a button and the materials get pushed across, right? They had to be hand pulled. So just kind of a way. So stonemasons carved the stones and then workers dragged huge blocks into place. Engineers had many theories of how about this difficult task was accomplished. Most agree that workers must have used a combination of ropes, ramps, ledges, levers to pull these massive blocks of stone. Pyramids such as the Great Pyramid of, Pyramids of Giza, among the largest monuments ever created. So if you look on the bottom, there's like a picture of the, uh, of the three pyramids of Giza. And these, again, are, obvious, are still standing in Egypt and millions and millions of people go every year to view them and look at them and see this history that was formed and created. So they just talk about how much, eff how much effort and creativity went to building and salvaging and maintaining these beautiful structures. So this kind of really talks about the architecture of ancient Egypt. Let's go ahead and flip over to um, daily life. Picking up on paragraph four, the Egyptians were ruled by a pharaoh, a god king who was both a religious and political leader. So it's kind of talking about how the pharaoh both was the religious god that the Egyptian um, civilians worshipped, but he also was like um, the president, the king, the ruler of the civilization. So he was kind of everything. There was no branches of, like how the U.S. has three branches of the government, there was no branches. It was, he was the sole protector of the civilization. So the Pharaoh had places, palaces throughout ancient Egypt and was attended to by many servants. Skilled workers and farmers, however, lived in villages and small towns scattered along the Nile River. And we know that the Nile River provided resources in abundance for the Egyptians. Daily life was vastly different for the royalty and the common people. So there was that aspect of the royal family and royalty having a very, very different life compared to the common people who had to work to survive and create different aspects like merchants, um, bakers, engineers, anything like that. They had to work to survive. So it kind of gives that that difference in life status. The majority of interests, the majority of Egyptians were poor farmers. They toiled on lands owned by the pharaoh near the Nile Valley. The flooding waters of the river covered the farmland and left a layer of fertile black mud. The, firmer, the farmers then planted seeds in the mud and harvested the crops. They used their crops to pay the taxes. Crops supported Egyptian life. So all of the land was owned by the pharaoh, right? And farmers would live on there, but they had to pay property taxes, similar to how we have to pay property taxes today. However, they paid their property taxes with the crops that was produced, and they were able to sell for food, for building materials, clothes, anything like that. However, the Nile River was such an abundant resource because it flooded annually it flooded once a year and that's what provided that neutral um, that fertile land and soil that was produced and the egyptians figured this out and was able to create a calendar a system that used the flooding of the nile river that allowed them to 
have such great success in farming. So the Egyptians' palaces were a hive of activity. So they're talking about the Egyptian palaces, like the pharaohs, like how they said the pharaoh had multiple different palaces throughout the kingdom. So he didn't just have one palace, he had multiple different ones he could like bounce between. And obviously they all held different purposes. A number of advisors and officials worked inside the palaces. There were lawyers, priests, scribes who wrote down important information. So we're talking about how the Egyptians had hieroglyphics and stuff that wrote down these discoveries and achievements that they um, encountered and created. There were jobs called a scribe, like we just read, whose job was to write everything down. So they would work in these palaces throughout the kingdom. They also had lawyers. They had their own system of law. So if someone broke the law, they had their own way of creating that system of accountability. The highest ranking official was the visor. The visor was a special advisor to the pharaoh and carried out his orders. So at each palace, there was a visor, right, who worked directly with the pharaoh, whose job was to enact policies and actions in that particular region of the palace. Um, on the bottom, we see ancient Egyptian limestone statues of Ramses II. So you can see how these are hand-carved by the artists in the golden age of Egypt. Let's go ahead and flip the page. Um, this one's talking about arts, which is, I think, going to go directly, which is going to be our direct tie to ancient Greece, because in the story we read about ancient Greece, it really referenced the arts. Okay, so let's talk about arts. Picking up on paragraph seven. Skilled workers used sim simple tools made of stone, bronze, and copper to create dazzling art. So let's go ahead and highlight that. Um, if we remember, they, ancient, Greece, um, ancient Greeks used uh, stone, marble, and bronze, right? So they kind of have similarities and differences. These artists created gold rings, pendants, and sparkling necklaces made of glass. They also created ornate glass jars. Sculptors shaped pots by hand or on the potter's wheel. So that's another example of technology that we still use in today's society. They used potter's wheels, but we still use potter's wheels and pottery and ceramics to this day, right? So it really goes to show how their use and creation of that technology is still in, involved in our arts in today's society. Um, where do we left off? Oh, potter's wheel. Then rubbed petals against the pot to make it shine. Artists also painted natural scenes on tiles. They used these tiles to decorate the floors on the pharaoh's palace. Many of the best artists worked for the pharaoh. Sculptors used wooden hammers and bronze chisels to carve reliefs on temple walls. These reliefs showed images of Egyptian gods and scenes from everyday life. Many of artists painted pottery and funeral masks in rich colors. These painted items would sometimes be placed in tombs. The Egyptians believed the dead would enjoy art even in the afterlife. So this really goes to show how important the afterlife was for these ancient Egyptians. It was so important for them to create this safe space for the tomb and the mummified body to be surrounded by. They, create, they used it as their favorite places, right? Their favorite things. They had statues, they had jewelry, they had pendants, they had vases, pottery, art, all of this to make sure that they were had an enjoyable afterlife. Um, okay, Archae uh, picking up on paragraph nine. Archaeologists and historians continue to make new discoveries about ancient Egypt. More recently, the ruins of a city known as, sorry if I butcher this, I know I am, Her Heracleion, were discovered 30 feet under the surface of the Mediterranean Sea near Alexandria. Again, the artifacts found were well preserved. So even 30 feet under 
um, the Mediterranean Sea, when they discovered this city, they still found artifacts and art and everything were well preserved and to be able to be memorialized and celebrated and discovered and shared with our world. Millions and millions of years of history shared and celebrated in our world. Um, again, oh, as Sir Barry uh, Cunliffe, an archaeologist, said, the archaeological evidence is simply overwhelming. By lying untouched and protected by the sand on the sea floor, centuries, they were brilliant, brilliantly preserved. So it really talks about how our civilization today, our world today, has been gifted, been shown these brilliant discoveries, these brilliant advancements in the world that are now we use in today's society as a way to learn from, as a way to discover all of these key points. And it's crucial for our discovery today. Hey guys, welcome to lesson two for the week. For social studies, today is Tuesday, April 21st. Um, we are going to go ahead and pick off where we left off yesterday. So um, go ahead and take out your newspapers. We're going to go ahead and, so yesterday we covered page one. So today we're going to go ahead and cover page two. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, same style as yesterday. I'm going to go ahead and read it first. I'm going to go ahead and read the newspaper first. And then um, we'll go ahead and break it down to the key points that I um, think are crucial to understanding of today of page two. So let's go ahead and start with um, the beginning of page two. So let's see. So talking about the Persian War, starting at number um, first paragraph. People have always interacted with their environment. Water and mountains surrounded the ancient Greek villages. To make life easier, Greek people formed centers of power called polis or city states. Athens and Sparta quickly grew to be the most powerful city-states. They often fought against each other, but they're willing to work together anytime Greece was threatened. So we kind of talked about that yesterday. The Persian Wars started when Cyrus the Great conquered Greek territory of Ionia around 545 BCE. Ionians tried to win back their freedom with a revolt, but they failed. The revolt caused the Persian Empire Emperor Darius to send a large amount, a large army into Greece. In 490 BCE, Darius sent about 25,000 soldiers and 600 ships to invade Greece. They landed on the plains of uh, Marathon. Athens had an army of 10,000 soldiers who stopped, who marched to stop them. So this is kind of talking about the background into the Persian Wars, which was a key aspect, was a key um, period when these wars were fought, were very key and crucial in the history of Greece. So let's go to um, Marathon, which is the next bolded section. The battle at Marathon is one of the most well-known battles of the ancient world. The Athenians were outnumbered, but in general, militaries had a plan. As soon as the fighting started, he ordered the soldiers, his soldiers, in the middle of the battle to retreat. So a form of military strategy. So when the Persian Wars happened, it talks about how they're willing to come together. Spartan and Athens combined their militaries. The Persians thought they were winning and charged ahead. Then the rest of the Athenian soldiers completely surrounded the Persian army and easily won the battle. By the time the Persian army surrendered, Around 6,400 of their soldiers had been killed, whereas the Athenians had only lost 192 soldiers. So it really talks about how they, yes, they were very, very, um, their army was very small compared to the, was very small compared to the Persians. However, their strategy, would, um, which led to their being able to be successful. So um, let's go on to the next one. Uh, thermo... I'm going to say thermoply um, in Salamis. I'm not 100% sure on pronunciation, but this is just my 
Um, yes, after Marathon, the Persian army sent, spent the next 10 years gathering one of the largest armies at a time. So it talks about the battle at Marathon. The next battle in the Persian War didn't occur for 10 years. By the time the army was ready, Darius had died, and his son, Exers, was the leader of Persia. Exers led his army to the narrow mountain pass called Thermopylae. This time, Spartans led the defense, but they only had about 7,000 soldiers who could reach the fight. The Greeks were heavily outnumbered, but they held off the Persian army for three full days before being defeated. After winning the battle, uh, Exers led his army to Athens. He ordered his troops to burn the city down. While this was happening, the Greek navy had gathered the had gathered in the Strait of Salamis. The Athenians' naval leader, Themistocles, had a plan to lure the Persian ships into a trap. So, even though the army was defeated, the per um, the Spartans and the um, Athenians' army had been defeated by Persia. They still had a backup plan to be able to defeat them on the waterfront, right? So they had a military strategy that reached all aspects of the war, not only on the grounds, but also on the water. Okay, so we're going to go down to the bottom where it says uh, world religion, world regions. So this one's kind of talking about the background of Greece. So Greece is a peninsula on the continent of Europe. A peninsula is a land surrounded by water on three sides. Look at the map and find the bodies of water that touch Greece. They are the Ionian Sea to the west, the Aegean Sea to the east, and the Mediterranean Sea to the south. Of these bodies of water, the Aegean Sea was the most important to the ancient Greeks. It was where the Greeks caught most of their fish. Also, Greeks traded with other nearby lands, and the Aegean Sea was safer and less windy than the open Mediterranean Sea. Even with all the small islands in the Aegean Sea, the Greeks could navigate well through the sea, even in time before compasses was invented. Greece highest, Greece's highest point is Mount Olympus, which is about 9,570 9, feet tall. The lower section of Greece is almost an island. This section is called the Pelop Peloponnese, a very narrow strip of land called the Ithamus connects the Peloponnese to the continent. About 3,000 islands are part of Greece. The largest is Crete. The coastline of Greece is dotted with harbors because the country touches so many seas. Many Greeks earn a living from the seas. Also because of the mild climate, there is a long crop growing season. One important crop of Greece is the olive. There are over 120 million olive trees in Greece. So let's go ahead and break down the key points um, that I feel are important in the understanding of page two. Again, color doesn't matter. Um, I'm just using a different color so that it's easier to interpret the differences. So let's go ahead and start with uh, polis on the top. So polis, I'm going to move this out of the way. Polis is um, another word for city-states, okay? So it's just another word for city-states, like we talked about yesterday, um, how I kind of view them as countries on the region of Greece is an easier way for me, I feel, to describe them. And polis is just a, the Greek word for city-states. So, and then I'm going to put right next to it, Athens and Sparta. being the biggest. Just as a way for you guys to um, just as a way for you guys to remember uh, that Polis is city-states because Athens and Sparta are easy to understand the difference. Um, and again, I'm always reading these out loud as I'm writing as a way, again, to um, share what I'm writing because sometimes with the glare and stuff, I'm still working on the angle of filming this. So next we talk about the Battle of Marathon, which again was in the Persian Wars. So I'm going to write in parentheses, in the Persian War. Wars. 
I'm gonna put wars just because it's multiple battles. War. I'm gonna put one war because it's multiple battles, not wars. So um, I have Persian War, um, and it is the the newspaper says. I'm gonna put another one of the most one of the most well known. One of the most well-known um, battles of the ancient world. And I'm going to put um, with semicolon Greece 1. Because remember, this battle was especially important because it talks about how, yes, even though Greece um, being Athens and Spartan armies were so far un undermanned, um, unnumbered, but they still used military strategies that favored their military technique rather than the number size of their armies, which allowed them to be victorious. Um, okay, Greece is a peninsula. So we're talking about the region of Greece is a peninsula. On the continent, this is a um, key word right here, continent. I'm going to go ahead and underline this because this is a very key word right there, continent. Continent of Europe. So this is basically saying that the region of Greece is a peninsula which we're going to de define next, on the continent of Europe. So say this is the continent of Europe, this whole long thing. So I'm going to say Europe right here. It's definitely on the actual, in real life, it's definitely a lot longer, but I don't really have a lot of space. So it's saying that this, say this is the continent of Europe, and this small little peninsula is Greece. So this makes up the larger portion, I mean, this makes up a portion of the larger continent of Europe. So let's define peninsula now, because that's kind of a weird term that everyone might know. Because um, they're saying Greece is a peninsula, so that's kind of a weird term. So I'm going to go ahead and define that. Um, a peninsula is a land. So a land, what we're able to stand on, move on, all of that. A land surrounded by water on three sides. So a peninsula is a land of water that's surrounded, that's a land surrounded by water on three sides. So I'm kind of running out of space, so let's do it right here. So say this is the peninsula. So here's um, the continent of Europe, and then I'm going to go down here and make it kind of like a boom. So this is Greece. This is Europe. So here's water. I'm going to say water one, water two, water three. So this makes Greece a peninsula. Because there's water on one side, water on two sides, water on three sides. Okay, that's really crucial. This is actually a very unique part that makes Greece such a desirable area that is um, has water on all three sides. And according to the newspaper and what we know, each side is a different sea, which is actually another really cool factor because you can be standing right here. And so say we put, let's put um, our directions, so never eat soggy waffles, that's how I remember it. So if we're standing right here, so we're looking at the east, um, this is going to be the Aegean Sea, right? If we're standing right here, um, 
the east is the Aegean Sea. So we're saying facing the south, right here at the end of Greece, and this is the south. This is going to be the Mediterranean Sea. Say we're fa we're standing right here. This is the west. We're going to be this is going to be the Ionian Sea. So I'm going to go ahead and put all of these right here. So let's say we're facing on Greece, we're facing the east. So I'm going to write east right here. This is going to be the Aegean Sea. Ah, hold on. So this is going to be the Aegean Sea. You do not have to know these per se, but it's kind of cool. I, I think it's kind of cool to be able to say, oh, I'm standing right here, but if I walk all the if we go travel all the way down here, we'll be in front of a different sea and so forth. So say we're at the south. That's going to be the Mediterranean Sea, which I feel like the Mediterranean Sea is kind of weird to spell. So let me look at it first. The Mediterranean Sea is one of the most well-known seas out of all of these, um, and it's also the largest. And then if we go west, it's going to be the Ionian Sea. So I think it's kind of cool to be able to look at it this way, um, that each side of Greece, except for the top portion that feeds into Europe, has its own separate sea that it borders. So um, we look at the Aegean Sea. The Aegean Sea was the most, which is going to be again towards the east. So I'm going to write right here, east. Again. You don't have to memorize that. It's just another cool fact. Um, the Aegean Sea was the most important to the Greeks. So I'm going to write was most important to the Greeks. And this being just the fact that it had abund an abundance of resources. So I'm going to say abundance of resources, meaning this is where they caught all of their fish, they had trade routes, because they were saying how this was less windy and it was safer to travel than the Mediterranean Sea, being that the Mediterranean Sea was larger and it bordered a lot of different countries. Um, but it, the Aegean Sea was less windy, it was safer to travel, they were able to catch, they had an abundance of fish um, to survive on, and it had a bunch of different materials and stuff that they were able to uh, resource or change into different things that they needed on the everyday life. So this was the most important sea towards the, to the Greeks. And if we look at the map, um, Athens, was right on the border of the of the Aegean Sea. So that's another cool fact right here. So if we were to pull, I know this is kind of like mirroring, but Athens would be kind of like right here. Um, Mount Olympus is the highest peak in Greece. I'm going to write in Greece. And it is at 9,570 feet tall. So it's kind of talking about how, that's basically saying how Athens is um, up high and then at 9,570 feet where it's Athens, I mean not Athens, uh, Mount Olympus. And it's this big monument, right? And on the lower part, of the island is where the remainder of the city is. So it kind of has this big, huge uproar of Mount Olympus, and then it goes down about 9,000 feet, and then you reach the rest of the city. So Mount Olympus was where it is very, very important in Greek mythology. So when we get reached that week, we'll definitely talk base more about Mount Olympus then. It's very important when talking about Zeus and um, a lot of the gods and goddesses for Greek mythology. So you'll definitely hear this again. 
So that's why it's important to talk about it now to give you that background information for when we go into Greek mythology, which again is very important um, in the later weeks. Um, lastly, Crete. We talked about this, right? The Meonians um, occupied Crete. We talked about it yesterday. Then the Mycenaeans came and conquered them and took over Crete. Um, so Crete is an island. It is part of Greece. So part of Greece. And it is the largest island on Greece. So largest island. Um, part of Greece. So I'm going to say largest island part of Greece. So when looking at a whole, when looking at Greece as a whole, Crete, the island of Crete is the largest that is um, on the region of Greece. So that's a good place to wrap up page two for today. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to go ahead and finish talking about page three, and then I'll also talk about the assignments uh, for the end of the week.